Representative Walker and I have participated in numerous Zoom meetings uh, since the General Assembly um, went on hiatus for COVID in March. Uh, this is the first time we've done a Zoom town hall, so we are very grateful for you guys uh, joining us tonight, and we hope it'll be informational for you. So, Mark, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say before we get started. No, it's uh, we've we've all had a pretty chaotic and rough week, and I uh, just. Uh, Glad that people could join us. I look forward to talking to you. Yeah. Okay, so um, we originally had the agenda of doing Restore Illinois and then a wrap up of the special session. We're gonna go ahead and go through those slides, but if there's anything that you guys have as far as questions related to uh, the current events, the protests and uh, the different um, actions that are being taken in light of the George Floyd murder, we'd be happy to uh, talk about that at the end. So with that, um, Zach, if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, actually you can go ahead and skip on to the next one. So Restore Illinois, as you know, that's our plan to safely reopen the economy. Um, you've probably seen this graph already several times. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on it. Um, but this is the, uh, we are currently in phase three, and this is the reference here. Um, this website is where you can get more information and track our regional progress to be able to move to the next phase. So basically in phase three, businesses are starting to reopen with some limitations. Um, gatherings are still limited to 10 people or fewer, Rest, and um, face coverings and social distancing are the norm. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll go into a little more detail about what specifically is open. Uh, first, how do we move between the phases? So before we can move to phase four, it's still gonna be the same metrics that we had moving from phase two to phase three. Positivity rates on testing, hospital bed availability, and our testing capacity. So, so far we're doing um, okay. We've been in phase three for about a um, little less than a week. Uh, but the key thing to remember here is that we can move backwards if benchmarks are not met and if benchmarks start to go back, so if they start to go backwards. There is some concern with all the protests uh, over the last week that we may actually see some rise in our metrics. Hopefully it won't be enough to send us backwards. You want to go to the next slide, please? So in phase three, manufacturing is open. Now, a lot of manufacturing was actually open in phase two. Um, any manufacturing that supported essential businesses was open in phase two, uh, but now all other manufacturing is able to open. Offices and non-essential retail can open with some limitations. Salons and barbers can open, and I don't know about you, but that's probably the one I am the most excited about, and I have my appointment to finally get my hair cut on Saturday. Uh, and new changes. So bars and restaurants are open for outdoor dining. In downtown Arlington Heights, for example, they're opening Arlington El Fresco. Um, and they've got, uh, they've created a walkway down the middle of the street on two blocks and allowing restaurants on either side of the street to set up tables. And it, it hopefully will be kind of a festive gathering. Um, it starts tonight for the first time. State parks and outdoor activities are open again. Gyms and health businesses are reopened and in-store shopping is open. Unfortunately, uh, just as they were starting to get open, things like some Targets and Walmart and um, well, Walmarts and some malls like Woodfield and Old Orchard have been closed um, out of fear of uh, riots moving to the suburbs. Hopefully that will all uh, um, die down a little bit and we'll have those things open again shortly. In phase four, bars and restaurants will be fully reopened. Schools and all child care will be open. Now some child care is open now. It was open for, not, for essential workers child care during phase two. It's now reopening with small groups and in a phase four, it will re reopen completely. Uh, and non-essential travel will be, again, um, encouraged during phase four. The thing to remember about phase four is we're still in social distancing and face coverings mode um, throughout both, both phase three and phase four. If we stay on track, 
phase four is targeted to begin at the end of June. Can we go to the next slide? So one thing I want to make sure that everybody's aware of is the workplaces are all required to meet safety guidelines that have been promulgated by IDPH and are posted at the DCEO, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity website. So those guidelines are there and that's the website right here where you can click, um, go to, to find out what the uh, type of guidelines are for your workplace. If your workplace is not adhering to those safety guidelines, you can, and I hope encourage you to report them to the Attorney General's office. The information is there on the screen. And the Department of Labor will also take those reports. I think they're important um, for those, uh, for these uh, reports to continue to go because that's how we get feedback on which uh, workplaces we need to go in and take a look at and uh, ensure that they are um, doing what they're supposed to be doing. We'll have a little bit more on some enforcement of that when we get to the labor omnibus bill. Next slide, please. So in Springfield for our special session, we, had, we were limited in what we focused on because we wanted to get it done quickly and safely. So we did several omnibus bills that focused on subject area, area labor, education, healthcare, um, hmm blanking on one of them, but we'll get there. And then the other big one was the budget. So Mark is going to take over now to do the budget. Uh, I'm glad to, glad to see you all. Yeah, we went down to Springfield and we had some major challenges, as you might expect. Uh, our revenue is projected to be way down. All kinds of tax revenues are down. Um, even the capital budget is under stress because if you recall, the gaming revenue was for vertical projects and the gasoline tax was to support the highway projects. Both of those are projected to be way down. So we went there with a big financial problem and we decided to focus primarily on COVID crisis and that the impact that has had and our costs. And it, it focuses on the people that are living through a crisis and the people that are worst, uh, worst impacted. First of all, the budget calls for a billion dollars to be spent um, larger than last time, last year, a billion more dollars to be spent on public health departments and the things they do, both at the state and the local level. The second thing is then a big piece of the budget, we decided to hold education funding flat. Uh, there's obviously a lot of pressure because we're billions of dollars short, but we decided that P through 12, K through 12, um, and preschool um, and higher education all would be held flat. There would be no difference. We wanted to add uh, more money for the, you know, the special funding, the, the distribution of money to the educational system. Uh, we couldn't come up with that, but we came out with flat so people would not be significantly harmed year to year. Next, we focused on key priorities for essential services like providing food and shelter to the elderly, uh, to children, to people suffering during the outbreak, and I'll go through some of those. It also provides additional support to small businesses and families that are struggling to provide resources to help seniors and people with disabilities stay in their homes, to protect abused and neglected children, and more than 600 million for small businesses that'll be distributed if they were impacted by COVID-19. Finally, it makes our full pension payment and it also uh, delivers 5% more to the local governments and distributed money so that we can take a little bit of pressure off local governments who otherwise would be raising property taxes. So th those are the overall. Next slide. Prioritizing the most vulnerable. First, we had rent and mortgage assistance grants of 396 million. Um, those, are, those are oriented all around the state, but some of it is dedicated directly to the communities that are most directly hit by the, this whole uh, pandemic and this economic crisis. So that was good. Um, 
we put in $60 million into our unemployment system. That is simply to make it work right. It's been a disaster and it's slowly getting better and needs $60 million in maintenance and support. We expanded Medicaid eligibility, especially for low income and undocumented seniors. And as I said, we provide 600 million funds in business relief. And those are focused specifically on areas most hit. Many of those funds are going to areas that are selected by low average income or other metrics that show that they're among our hardest hit communities. We have immigrant welcoming centers. That's really funding so that they can get, undocumented people can get the same COVID-19 net network help and healthcare help that other peoples are getting. Also community care programs for seniors. We added 180 million for DCFS, which was hollowed out last year. Uh, 90, 90 million for more in care for people with developmental disabilities and another 100 million for people with developmental challenges to live in their own homes. And finally 30 million and more in substance abuse programs. So although we, we held the basic budget flat, except for the COVID healthcare, uh, which we're gonna get hopefully reimbursed by the federal government, um, we did add a lot of funds year to year to the areas that, uh, and people that most need it. Um, next slide, please. There is no, in case you're wondering, there are no raises for legislators. Uh, it's a fairly complicated um, system, but in fact, we allocated no money for it. We have no, no money in the budget and the controller agrees that there will be no payments. So there are no raises for legislators. the election under this bill. This is uh, not only, it's the next slide, not only um, is this something we should be doing, improving access and availability to everyone so that they can vote, but especially in the coronavirus pandemic, we want to make sure that we can do whatever we can to protect people's health. And vote by mail is very important to this. Basically, any person who has voted in any way or registered since the last election who has voted in the last two years will get an application by mail. Those applications are going to be mailed by August 1st. And um, we went through a lot of different options on this, but this is, uh, this is what we settled on. It will be really four mailings. First of all, people are going to get notified by the Secretary of State on the, uh, the um, amendment language on the graduated tax along with a notice that we're gonna have vote for mail, look for the application and this is how you can participate. Then the uh, mailer goes out August 1st. Um, Secretary of State is also sending out what are called chase um, media where they're gonna mail to people who got an application and did not turn in their ballot on September 15th and then a follow-up mailer again on October 15th. Finally, um, the way this works is that mail-in ballots will be processed, meaning um, once the application is received, the election authorities are required to send a ballot to that person or to what, what um, verifiable address they provide within two days. So every, any application received before October 1st will be sent out by October 6th, and after that, everyone will get their ballot in two days. When the ballots come in, the signatures are checked by three people, and we're going to need extra judges to do that, to work with the election authorities to check signatures. And the ballots can be prepared but not counted prior to election day. They'll start being counted by, by election day. So we also expanded early voting. We expanded the hours. We allowed for curbside collection of ballots. Uh, we also made for the purposes of this election, election day as a state holiday, meaning government entities are closed and schools are closed on election day. The, other th the reason is primarily that we can have safe places for people to cast their ballots available to us. 
and schools and government offices are often used or have been in the past and will be open and free of other people so that we can use them on election day. So not only are we gonna have early voting, we're gonna have mail-in voting, we're gonna have curbside voting, we're gonna have expanded um, sites for voting and longer hours and election day is a state holiday. This whole thing is only for the 2020 November election. Uh, we, there, this is a very controversial within the legislature. Some people on both sides. In fact, we wanna make this work well in November so that we can expand it next time. So that's the election omnibus bill. Want the next one? Education omnibus bill. This is a bill that, that allows for all kinds of activities that occur, have been occurring in schools and makes them regular and makes them follow statute and set goals for them. The primary changes are to allow various school activities to be done virtually or online or a mixture of two. So we can have a transition period between all virtual and, and online or all in person. We can have hybrids of both over time. We also extended educator licenses and renewals, and we did that for all kinds of licenses, uh, including our, our automobile licenses. Um, we allow past failed classes to count as transferable credits. Um, we did not include the proposed seclusion room provisions, and I'm going to let Ann talk to that one. Is it? Anne? Yeah, Jack had to unmute me. <laughs> Sorry. You can take this one. So um, the seclusion room provisions um, were, as you might have seen from a Tribune article, we were actually ready to go on them. We had the votes lined up despite a last minute objections by uh, some school administrator groups um, over some of the administrative provisions that were in the law. It had nothing to do um, well, I'll just leave it at that, <laughs> at the administrative provisions of the bill. However, because the session was focused on COVID related items or items necessary for continuity of government, we did not get it, it did not make it into the education omnibus. So uh, we are going to move forward with that in veto session. So watch for more to come on that in November. If we can go to the next slide, please. We did a healthcare omnibus, and this one was packed with a number of provisions. Um, we did a, a couple of provisions that were related to uh, specific healthcare services, such as telehealth services and the kidney disease task force. Um, as you may have been reading, some of the um, impacts of COVID have been, uh, they're finding patients coming off ventilators or ending up needing dialysis, uh, and reasons for that, um, probably related to the use of the ventilator, although they're still trying to determine if it's related to the uh, virus itself. So we're doing some kidney disease task force um, prevention and education. We put uh, some funding into uh, um, telehealth to continue that, at least through the end of the year. Um, we expanded Medicaid eligibility, as we mentioned during the budget um, slides, to vulnerable seniors. We expanded Medicaid coverage to include cancer clinical trials. Um, we uh, had a provision in there that's going to launch the healthcare affordability study. That is an initiative of the governor's office to evaluate best practices and options used across the country. And it could lead to us having a public option available in Illinois. So I'm very excited about that one. And then finally, we did the hospital assessment program. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, um, there is a mechanism under the federal law to achieve um, uh, federal matching on funding that will help direct money to areas that are predominantly served by Medicaid. So with an acknowledgement by the federal government that what we call safety net hospitals here in Illinois do not have access to other sources of income because their populations that they serve are predominantly Medicaid covered and Medicaid uh, payments do not 
are generally less than the cost of service. So um, this allows us to do some shifting of money um, to help support those hospitals. So the way it works is that hospitals pay a tax into um, a program that the money generated from that tax is matched by the federal government and then reallocated to hospitals based on their utilization um, of Medicaid outpatient and inpatient services. So hospitals that have a higher Medicaid utilization rate are gonna receive more of the funding as the money goes is redistributed back out. So that's a very simple way of talking. It's actually, a, a, as you can expect with this kind of a program, it's fairly complex, um, but that, that's the intention of the program. And it does bring us $3 billion in additional federal match dollars. So it was a very significant one to get past. We can go to the next slide, please. We also focused on a couple of labor packages. Again, most of this was COVID related. Um, the changes in the unemployment insurance benefit to expand the benefit waives the waiting periods. Employers will not be charged for benefits given due to COVID-19. So it attempts to hold employers harmless as they're struggling to regain um, uh, their footing. School support staff will now be eligible for unemployment. They were not previously. And it also keeps us, the provisions that we um, enacted, keep us eligible for future federal relief if the next round of uh, stimulus packages gets passed. We also did some work on workers' compensation. to, And the whole goal behind this was to incentivize employers to follow those workplace safety guidelines we talked about earlier. So you remember the governor in one of his executive orders sought to create a rebuttable presumption that for, at that time, first responders, if they had contracted COVID-19, it would be presumed that it had happened at the workplace. Normally under workers' comp, the presumption is that, um, the presumption is on the employee to prove that they did contract it at work. In this situation for COVID, it would be on the employer to rebut that they didn't contract it at work. So what we wanted to expand it, we wanted to expand it to more than just first responders. So we expanded it to all of the essential employees. Um, and uh, it, it allows the employer to rebut the presumption if the employee worked from home for 14 days prior to the date of diagnosis, or the employer can demonstrate that for 14 consecutive days prior to the date of diagnosis, they had implemented in full the workplace safety guidelines for their um, industry. Those are the two conditions on which they can rebut the presumption. If they do rebut the presumption through one of those, the employee can still utilize the normal workers comp evidentiary rules to still try to prove that they are eligible for coverage. Um, but this just makes it easier for employees that are on the front lines to be able to uh, demonstrate eligibility for workers' compensation. Um, we also uh, in plus rules that protect retail workers. We are seeing some instances of retail workers that were being subject to assault um, by patrons who were either very frustrated with the uh, rules that were in place in retail organizations or, or other kinds of um, escalated emotions during these periods. So we did um, put in some protections for those workers, pr primarily in grocery stores. And we um, expanded uh, the ability for racetrack workers, what they call the um, backyard workers, to be able to collectively bargain. These workers are, um, they, do not, they do not have access to regular health care. Um, and during and they are living in uh, congregate living type facilities. So uh, we wanted to do something to protect them since they are also at greater risk, greater risk during the COVID uh, period. So that we did give them the right to collectively bargain as a means to try to get them a little more protection. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. So those were our omnibus packages. Um, for this session. Now we are going to be back in session during veto, which will be in November after the election for two weeks. 
uh, the week before Thanksgiving and the week after Thanksgiving. We're hoping to move a lot of the legislation that we put aside to deal with the COVID and government continuity issues during the special session so that we can keep moving things forward. Um, included in that will be, um, as we talked about earlier, the seclusion bill and some of the other, we also had been working on an affordable housing uh, package that was going to create a couple of different avenues to, to incentivize developers to create more affordable housing. Um, some of the bills that were um, uh, introduced related to ethics and property tax relief, um, we're hoping to ha uh, get some votes done during the veto session. So it'll probably be a more active veto session than what we normally see. Uh, and we will definitely be back in touch with you during that time frame. So with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions you may have. So I just wanted to reiterate really quickly, if everyone can hear me, um, Jack posted this in the chat, but some of you I think have joined uh, who didn't hear the intro. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, thank you, Senator and Representative. Um, our first question uh, is about uh, vote by mail. And the question is, uh, with so much buzz about vote by mail fraud, uh, what will Illinois do to prevent fraud and prove that it did not happen? Well, there, there certainly is a lot of discussion about it. Um, the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the, number one, we're going to only mail applications for ballots to people that already voted in the last two years and have thereby established their identity and their, their um, address. But also every one of those applications is going to be reviewed for accuracy. And then when the ballot returns, the signature is going to be um, checked by three election judges, which is more than happens actually at the poll, and and verified in that way. Um, that's the primary way. I, I, we're going to have drop-off boxes for people that don't trust the mail, actually, um, so that they can, like you do, where you can pay your property tax at a drop-off box at a, a whole bunch of different government agencies. Um, we're going to do that as well. I don't expect there to be a lot of fraud, but I, I, it was interesting to hear the arguments against this from the, the other side of our aisle that uh, this was entirely some kind of scheme to build up fraud when it, when it in fact is a plan to actually encourage voting during a pandemic. All right, um, I'll ask for the next question. Um, it is related to um, some of the protests we've seen. Uh, what are the police departments doing to protect peaceful protesters? I've participated in a few and haven't seen any police presence, except for some officers driving by in their cars. One of the officers appeared to be taking a photo of me with his iPhone. You know, um, I've attended a couple of the local um, events myself and have not seen um, a lot of police. And I think that's by design. Um, I think that they are not wanting to uh, create a tenser situation with their presence. Um, so they are uh, trying to keep some distance. Uh, however, I was in one in downtown Arlington Heights over the weekend. Uh, there was one incident that people reported to the police on. There was a uh, gentleman in a car driving by yelling out racial epithets at uh, some of the young uh, high school uh, protesters. Um, I, that got an immediate response by the Arlington Heights Police Department. They did come and um, uh, uh, block the driver and uh, spoke to him. Uh, from what I could see from my vantage point, they did uh, get the driver to issue an apology to the individual and uh, she seemed to be satisfied with that. Um, and then they escorted him away and I'm not exactly sure where they took him, but they escorted him away. Um, so at least in the suburbs so far, um, we've seen what I think is a reasonable police response in that it's not um, omnipresent and therefore not exacerbating any tensions that may exist. Um, and yet seems to be uh, very, um, uh, it seems to be nearby and acting quickly when activated from what I've been able to see. With regard to taking pictures, I will say there have been a number of uh, 
I, the rallies I've been at, um, both uh, bystanders and uh, participants in the rallies have been taking pictures. So at the incident I mentioned with the police department um, arriving in Arlington Heights, everybody that was watching the event unfold um, had a camera, had a phone out and was taking at least one picture. I did not see any of the police department doing that, although they may have had body cams that were running. Um, so again, if you do see a, uh, if, if you feel threatened in any way by the situation, um, you certainly can uh, raise that with um, others that are there, the organizer of the march or um, other types of organizations. The ACLU also is maintaining um, active hotlines for anything that you need to uh, report and they have legal staff standing by. So um, I would definitely check out their website as you're heading out to any uh, rally or protest so that you can uh, have that information handy in case you should need it. Mark, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, no, that that's fine. Um, I, I would I would add actually we see so many news reports of so many different kinds of activities. Uh, my own experience has been that for the most part the organizers of protests always want them to be peaceful, um, and the police would like that as well. And but there there are always others who have other agendas, and that makes it very difficult for both sides. The protests I've been in are most successful when the organizers are well organized and in fact um, try to argue against others who want everything to escalate. Um, but you know every situation is different and not every not every protest is the same and certainly not every police action is the same. Okay great um, our next question kind of shifting gears um, what are the guidelines for gyms? You know, you will find those at that DCEO website. Um, I don't remember all the guidelines. I know there is a lot of information there about having to um, sanitize equipment um, prior, in between use, having to move stage, uh, equipment, um, uh, social distancing distances apart, so six feet apart, um, having um, workers there wearing masks, understanding that I I think there's reference there to the fact that when you're working out on all the equipment, you may not be able to wear a mask, um, but to use them in other parts of the facility. Uh, so I would definitely check out the guidelines there, but I, I know there are ones specific to gyms that are posted. Okay, that's all we have in the chat right now. Um, if anybody has any other questions, it'd be a good time to to pop them in or, or send them to Jack. I think he's kind of fielding some of them right now also. Um, Terry asked, is there uh, any news about CJA, Clean Energy Jobs Act? Um, CJA is definitely on the agenda for the um, veto session. Um, there are still, and Mark, you may have more of an update on this. The last update I had is they were still trying to negotiate between the CJA bill and the um, other bill that focused um, on, took a slightly different take. There were two competing bills and they were still trying to negotiate to bring them together into one omnibus bill. Um, and I don't, I don't know that they've, because we shut down for everything, I don't know whether they've reached uh, any agreement or not. Yeah, let me, uh, let me say the other bill is the Path to 100 bill. Actually, if you look at them side by side, they agree about 80%. And we tried while we were there to take just some of the core pieces that we thought we could get through that related to economic recovery and just pass those pieces as part of the economic recovery part of this, this budget, but uh, didn't succeed. I expect it'll come up again. I think it will be one of the top, if not the top tool to use for economic recovery. I certainly hope that that's what we're gonna push in the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Carol asked um, what the status of the bio bill is and other gun safety legislation. Um, 
The bio bill is really the uh, predominant gun bill uh, for this session. Um, and there is definitely talk about trying to bring that back in veto session. Um, it was not, um, it didn't make it onto any of the omnibus packages because it, it didn't meet the criteria of being COVID related or continuity of government related. Um, so I know that there are, uh, the sponsors are still working to try to uh, ensure they have the votes to be able to pass it during veto. So um, we'll just have to keep uh, our eyes on that one. I don't have anything uh, more definitive than that to be able to share. Okie dokie, that's the end of the list of questions again so far. If anybody else has any other questions, good to submit. I'm really tempted to start saying have all voted who wish, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are online? Um, we've got quite a few. We have another one that just uh, popped in and said, Susan wanted to know if this will be available later. Um, I'm assuming the recording or? Yes, the, re the video recording. Yes, it will be. It will be posted. Um, will it, be, it will be posted in our social media sites for both uh, Mark and myself. Great. And we just got another one. Um, at, so after the general election, um, what steps need to be taken to make Illinois a vote by mail state? I assume permanently going forward. Oh, well, we have to pass another bill that says exactly what we want to do. Uh, we're assuming at least the, the supporters of this, this plan that it'll go well and we'll just expand it for all future elections. Um, it, we'll see. Uh, I hope it works. I know the the supporters of the bill want it to be permanent, uh, but the the things that we were really you know restricted to doing this time were COVID related. So that was our focus this time, the healthcare aspects of it. But it, we should do it. Great. Do we have any others? Um, here's, okay, we just got another one. Um, how confident are you that employers will be able to keep employees safe, especially in small workplaces? Well, you know, that's a big part of why um, I pushed on the workers' comp. I, I was um, on the team that, that did the negotiation on that one. Because in my experience, as many of you know, I, I spent a number of years in the corporate sector, as did Mark. And in my experience, when uh, there's anything that requires a layout change um, in a, um, particularly in a manufacturing environment um, where you're moving equipment as well, it really takes uh, some financial incentive to uh, get an employer to do it because it costs them money um, to move these things around. Um, having, uh, knowing that they would be on the hook uh, for workers' comp if they don't comply, I think it's a pretty strong incentive. And one of the things that validated that for me is that after the rule was put in place that ultimately got retracted and then replaced with the statute, um, Mark and I got immediate calls from our chambers of commerce in the district um, and spent some time on Zoom phone calls with them trying to talk through the issue and get their understanding. And in fact, um, part of their concern with regard to workers working from home led to that one piece of, of uh, that one rebuttable presumption that if you sent somebody at home, it's a fair point, you can't control what their situation is at home in their home workplace. So if they've been there for 14 full days before contracting it, then we're gonna assume that they did not get it at the workplace. Um, with regard to smaller offices, uh, I know there was some concern with like things like insurance agencies and places like that that have small office space. Um, and they were looking to have some kind of an exemption from the law and from the workers' comp piece. And what we said, uh, to, we did not give them any industry an exemption because uh, there are ways that you can do it. If they're desk jobs, you can arrange more work at home. You can arrange um, uh, staggered schedules um, to be able to maintain social distancing. There is a fair amount of latitude that um, employers can do if they are incentivized to do it. 
And um, so that the thought is that the workers' comp uh, liability is going to be a good incentive uh, to get them to uh, take the steps that they need to. You as individuals and as workers, we all also have the opportunity to uh, make the reports to the Attorney General's Office or the Department of Labor. I know during the phase two period, the Attorney General was actively responding to every request it had gotten. When we started the negotiations on the workers' comp legislation, uh, the AG reported that they had investigated 1,000 cases already at that point. A number of them were in meatpacking um, work sites uh, in the western suburbs. <laughs> and uh, they did, yeah, I know. And they did take some action and got some change done. Um, so that's another avenue uh, to also uh, be, be sure that you uh, advocate for yourselves in these situations as well. Okay, great. Any others? Um, we're nearly done. We're nearly done. Jack just sent this in, though. I have to be honest. I don't know if this is... Uh, from him personally or from somebody else. But uh, for their first question is, uh, how have you been keeping busy? Well, um, during the time when we weren't in Springfield, we actually uh, created a number of work groups, again, by subject matter. Um, and that led to uh, putting together what became the omnibus bills and um, identifying what we were gonna prioritize later. So for example, I chaired the Senate Working Group on Ethics, and we went through all the different um, ethics bills that had been introduced. We went through the recommendations um, that were, the final recommendations we're still waiting for, but the interim uh, conversations from the ethics task force that the governor set up, um, and have some ideas about some things that we can do. It also led to two Senate rule changes uh, that we implemented um, uh, that will help govern the way the Senate at least operates uh, themselves, including the creation of a permanent government affairs and ethics committee. So um, we did make some progress on things. Not everything uh, had to actually have a piece of legislation attached to it to move forward. Um, and so that was a big chunk of what we did. That's where I, I learned a lot about how to run a Zoom meeting during uh, those 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah, I focused on, uh, on financials. I was on the Economic Recovery Task Force, on the Budgeting Task Force, and on the Capital or Infrastructure Task Force. And what we really focused on and what I personally did was figuring out ways that the funds that we do get get directed to the communities and businesses that most need them, as opposed to just across the board. So a lot of what happened in this budget where that actually was successful came out of our working group. That's terrific. I also spent way too much time baking, so I have to stop that now. <laughs> All right, so final question. Um, any Netflix recommendations? Oh. Uh, let's say, well, you know what? I'm gearing up to watch Laurel Canyon. Oh, that's epics. That's not Netflix. <laughs> I have a question for this audience. If you can get back to us via email, since I hope you all know our email. Um, do you think we should have a special session related to the challenges in policing and the dis disparate impact on communities of color in the state? And if so, what should we work on? Because we're, we're having that discussion right now and we'll never have a special session unless we can narrow down the actual um, agenda to things we can actually do in the short term. Otherwise, we'll just wait until veto session. So I'd like feedback on that. We actually did have one more. Um, Mark, have you had any time to spend on gerrymandering? Ah, yes. 
I've had plenty of time. <laughs> the question is when? Um, what we, we have only one really, I, I believe we have only one path now, and that's to take kind of the, the rulemaking um, route where we're going to have a resolution that establishes rules for whoever draws the map to achieve metrics, metrics on fairness, metrics on compactness, metrics on contiguity, all the metrics that people want, maybe even a metric on creating competitive districts, apply those metrics, establish them and uh, give them to whoever draws the map and say that we won't vote for the map unless it achieves these metrics. That should simplify the, the discussion away from, you know, just fluff. It's unfair because I say it's unfair or it looks unfair or maybe it is unfair. There are metrics to determine bias and there are metrics to determine compactness and metrics to determine efficiency. So I say we apply them as we would if we were in the corporate world and go that route. So I've been working on that. Awesome. Well, I believe that's all the questions we have. A lot of thank yous in the chat. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I look forward to when we can do these in person again. Um, I miss getting to see you all. And uh, hopefully everyone stays healthy, um, stay safe, and uh, we'll talk with you soon. Thank you all. Good night, everyone.